Hello, dear listeners. Thanks for joining us on our first show of 2014. And to reward you for listening, I've come up with a topic that I think is pretty compelling. We're going to explore a side of your genome that has been underreported and underappreciated. We've all heard a lot about how genes make us who we are, how they specify everything from our body type to our health profile and even our personality. They are the master plan, the script, the operating system, the blueprint. And when we say that something is in our DNA, we mean that it is part of our fixed and essential nature. Genes are the boss, they bark out the orders, and our bodies and maybe even our minds have little choice but to obey. And yes, of course, all kinds of environmental factors like nurture are also affecting us through other channels. But the idea remains that genes are in charge of their own affairs. Well, today we are going to get a very different take, one that turns that whole picture more or less on its head. We're going to be talking about genes not as shot callers, but as listeners, very sensitive listeners who don't run things in top-down dictatorial fashion, but who are actually taking their cues from their surroundings, from our bodies, from our social circumstances, and even our thoughts and feelings. And if that's beginning to sound too woo-woo for you, well, just remember, we do real science on this show. We are not all about mystical, airy-fairy stuff. And we have a real scientist here to explain things for us. He is Steve Cole, professor of medicine and psychiatry at UCLA, and one of a number of scientists who are sketching out an increasingly nuanced portrait of responsive, environmentally attuned genes. He and his colleagues are helping to pioneer a new field of research that he refers to, for lack of a better term, as social genomics. Myself, I'd be tempted to call it molecular psychology if that didn't sound so flaky. But whatever you call it, it has deep implications and it is pretty trippy to contemplate. So I invite you to tune in, kick back, and trip out on today's interview with Steve Cole. Steve, thank you for joining me. Sure, my pleasure. Let's start with your background. You started out majoring in and getting a Ph.D. in psychology. At that point, what did you think you'd be working on? What was the problem you were orienting toward at that early stage of your studies? I think I have always been interested in how... Things that are ethereal become very concrete and real. How our minds and our brains can convert both perceptions of what's actually out there in the world and then by adding meaning to that, um, sometimes, you know, fantasies and hallucinations and fears and desires into actual concrete molecular biology within our bodies. Literally, um, our perceptions and beliefs changing who we are in a very concrete way. Well, there's this traditional divide in the sciences. Um, at least when I say traditional, it goes back maybe 100 years or more. Maybe it goes back to Descartes, but between mind and matter, body and brain, all of that. Um, and there was a time when a scientist would study physical things, physiological things, or a psychologist or something more touchy-feely would research feelings, emotions, uh, thoughts. And then there was that little area where they met that was often dismissed as psychosomatic, right? When you started out, what was the state of that division? Uh, I think you're, you're right in characterizing that as a small intersection at the point that I started out, which was really in the sort of late 1980s. Um, but what changed um, our capacity to kind of dilate that, that space of intersection was surprisingly enough molecular biology, which you would think would send us down the rat hole, mm -hmm. but in fact accidentally gave us a sort of a, a lexicon for understanding the system of the human body as a whole in one fell swoop without having to focus on one organ or one cell type or, or even one molecule. We, we During the 1980s and 1990s really started to, to see this sort of one or a few molecules at a time starting to get a sense of how cells work together. And then there was this pretty transformative event where we were able to sequence the whole human genome. And that is when you had this potential to start sniffing out these grand design principles about how the system as a whole worked. It was really 
the development of this comprehensive measurement infrastructure that allowed us to have this more comprehensive insight into how the system worked as a whole. But I'm guessing if you went to a molecular biologist back then, or many of them today, <laughs> and said, you know, uh, I'm interested in the mind and its intersection with molecules, proteins and DNA and RNA and other factors like that, they would have said, forget about it, you know? I mean, we're looking at the material reality here. You psychologists go off and tell your stories, but uh, that's, not, that's not our turf at all. Yeah, that's true. Um, there is still quite a lot of that. And uh, I have to say, just in the last couple of days, I've been, you know, sort of contending with exactly these kinds of, of uh, remarks now about, you know, how positive psychological factors, uh, never mind uh, stress and, and misery, might potentially, you know, sort of leave a fingerprint in the, the, you know, sort of molecular function of our bodies. So I, it is, though, I believe, probably this domain of stress biology that first helped cement that proposition mm. that, you know, it's not just, um, you know, thoughts locked away in your mind, seated within your brain, but somehow disconnected from the rest of your body. Starting in the you know 1930s and 1940s, we were able to map out slowly, you know, uh, initially it took decades for, for relatively small amounts of progress. And then with this, you know, explosion of genomics infrastructure in particular, we can now look at this whole system and say, okay, when somebody is experiencing long periods of threat or uncertainty, uh, we may not understand how that conscious experience literally lives in the activity of cells. But we can reliably say that when people feel that way, certain parts of the brain function differently, and those parts of the brain turn out to be wired up to the rest of our bodies. And so with the emergence of fight-or-flight nervous system, you know, with Walter Cannon's work, uh, stress hormones and Hans Selye's work, we started to have a sense of if, if at least we could jump out of consciousness and into brain activity, we could start to follow the ripples of information and influence out into the rest of the body and understand uh, how they were impacting these you know, peripheral physiologic processes. So mm -hmm. that was really a, a key initial mm -hmm. path. So you were thinking about these things early on, but when did it become real for you in terms of research? Well, there were a couple of sort of touchstone results uh, It started to kind of sketch out both a path and a, even more broadly uh, a rationale for looking at these kinds of issues. And I think the, one of the first things that really grabbed me was when I was uh, a postdoc. And I was just starting to harness this molecular machinery to make sense of health and disease. And at the time, this was the, the early 1990s, um, you know, really in the society at the time, the, the disease that loomed largest in the, you know, sort of humanity's imagination was HIV infection. It was an infectious disease. It was uh, literally slaughtering large numbers of people. And uh, despite our immense technology and, and deep insight, we were not able to do very much to slow that virus down for quite a long time, for a surprisingly long time. What was striking at that time is that our molecular biology infrastructure had become you know, terrifically penetrating. So we understood this pathogen very, very well. We knew its genome inside and out. We knew a lot about which cells it lived in, how it hijacked the cellular machinery to you know, sort of its own purposes to make more copies of itself, how it hid out in cells of the immune system as a strategy for evading the immune system. We had a tremendous amount of information about this scourge. But we still didn't really understand why it took down some people really quickly and left other people largely spared. Um, in the years that have passed, we've come to understand some of the individual differences in genetics that seem to influence this. But at the time, there was also a lot of interest in how people's life circumstances and their experiences might potentially interact with this. So one of my first you know, projects as a, a postdoc was looking at uh, gay men with HIV infection and asking what kinds of psychological and social factors really seemed to just associate with differences in disease progression. Hmm. And there was a host of usual suspects at the time, social support, socioeconomic status, negative affect, you know, emotions like sadness or anger or fear. 
And none of these really distinguished themselves uh, in, in the math. We looked at who got sick and who died, how fast, and tried to relate that. To you were us. just looking at correlations. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Just trying to find out really at this point what really mattered. And many of the things that we suspected would matter, it turns out, did not. But in the lives of these gay men, what really did matter, according to the math, was whether they were in the closet or not. It was the closeted gay men that got sick and died about 25 to 30 percent faster than their you know, seemingly similar compatriots who were out of the closet. So they could start off in a 10-year longitudinal study tracking the progress of disease with the same high CD4 T-cell counts, the same good physical health, and you would watch those T-cell counts dive about 20 to 30 percent faster, and uh, all the diseases onset 20 to 30 percent faster, and eventually people die 20 to 30 percent faster, just as a function, it looked like, of, of being in the closet. Now, the big question, is it being in the closet, is it keeping your life in the shadows or somehow concealing something basic about yourself? Is that the cause or is there another cause that's correlated with that closeted behavior, like not going to doctors, not taking <laughs> care of yourself and so on? How'd you sort that out? Well, to some extent, we can measure not going to the doctors and not taking care of yourself. And we can ask, you know, does that account for mm -hmm. these differences? Is, are the differences due to the people who are in the closet and don't go to the doctors and don't take care of themselves? And to the best of our ability uh, to, to measure those things, we found that wasn't the case. Uh -huh. However, uh, we did end up, after a, a couple of initial studies had identified this as a surprisingly powerful mathematical correlation um, with, with no direct information about cause, but it was clearly a, a big relationship of some sort, we started to discover that it may not have been so much the act of being in the closet per se that was the risk factor as the nature of the people who felt that that was the best way for them to live. That perhaps this was really a story about temperament and people's experience of the social world, people's experience of acceptance versus rejection, people's experience of safety versus threat. How did you go from that, which might be called a you know sort of epidemiological survey-based approach, to this major question that you've obviously been working on for years, which is the effect on genes and what's called gene expression? Mm -hmm. Um, and you should probably explain what gene expression is. Sure. Let me, let me explain in that exact context. So, you know, HIV, and in fact all viruses, it turns out are little more than genomes. Uh, unlike us, organisms, or, or even cells, these genomes that are viruses have no capacity to make copies of themselves. They're not living in any true sense. They only live when they can slip themselves inside our own cells and hijack our own protein production machinery. It's really the proteins that are the engines of a cell that make things happen in the real world. They're created at the uh, instruction of genes, but uh, if a genome doesn't express itself in the form of protein, it actually has no physical impact on the world. It's just a, a stretch of nucleotides mm -hmm. sitting there uh, you know, laying out on the beach, if you will. <laughs> so, so a virus is just a strand of DNA or a strand of RNA, a little protein coat around them. Uh, but in order for anything to happen, they have to get into the genome of some host cell. Yeah, they need to get in there where the protein production factories can actually interact with that genome. Now, it turns out that gene expression, the process of taking a DNA or an RNA template and, you know, copying it into a form of RNA that can then be turned into protein and subsequently, um, you know, sort of power the activity of a cell or confer some kind of functional characteristic or capacity. That whole process is highly contingent. If you just put genes in a cell, the cell will generally not actually actively express them. The mm. genes won't become anything in terms of protein. Mm, they'll just sit there like a book that hasn't been opened and read. That's exactly right. So what genes need to actually become a protein that influences the world is uh, some kind of affirmative signal that they should be transcribed into RNA. 
that that's not an automatic done deal. And in fact, now that we can look at all of the genes in the human genome in one fell swoop, we find that in any given cell, uh, typically uh, half or, or less of the genes that are in there are actually actively expressed mm. at any given point in time. Mm. So there's a lot of cellular decision-making that needs to take place to get a gene expressed. Mm. If you think of the whole genome that's in our cells, think of it as a massive cookbook or a multi-volume cooking series, but which actual dishes get cooked is really what counts. And at any given time in a cell, right, they're only cooking some of those dishes, by no means all the recipes. Is that a reasonable analogy? <laughs> yeah, that is a reasonable analogy. And let's stretch it a little bit farther and think about uh, a menu of possible gene expression profiles, different combinations of genes that are expressed. This becomes a, a menu of options for how a genome can behave or, by extension, how a cell or an organism can behave. So this general principle applies equally to viral genomes as it does to the, the human genome. So when we're trying to understand why some people get sick and die when they have HIV infection faster than other people do, it turns out that's really a question about gene expression. That's a question about how is it that this person, the life they lead, and the body that results from that can more efficiently turn on the key genes in the viral genome that allow it to replicate, make copies of itself that then go off and infect other immune cells and eventually, uh, largely by accident, take out the immune defenses of, of that person. And so, if, if those genes don't get expressed, then the virus doesn't replicate and you stay healthy. That's exactly right. So at that time, we understood enough about the genetic basis for viral infections to know if people are getting sick and dying faster, that is fundamentally a story about viral gene expression. So this is the way virologists do their work. And so after having done those epidemiology studies that I described and coming uh, you know, increasingly clear in a suspicion that fight or flight stress biology was somehow interacting with this viral gene expression process, that uh, prompted me to undertake a second postdoctoral fellowship, which uh, I will say was uh, tedious and, and economically harrowing, but in the end, uh, probably a, a good investment. So, uh, uh, I, I want to ask how much you spent on this education, but I'll, I'll leave that aside. <laughs> years and years, <laughs> perhaps more even so than dollars. Oh, really? Wow. But we've got some dots here. We've got the fact that you found you know tight correlations between some uh, you know, social circumstances and, uh, as you said, temperamental types and how one fared with HIV. And gene expression, on the other hand, which genes are turned on, which ones aren't turned on. I imagine you somehow connected those dots. Yeah, I did. And it was predominantly through that concept of fear. So what we understood about this temperament, this socially sensitive temperament, is that it probably wasn't intrinsically social, that one of the dominant theories about why people were sensitive to social rejection and therefore uh, if, if they were gay might be inclined to stay in the closet and avoid that kind of rejection when other people would be you know, more comfortable being out of the closet and, and less stressed by having to conceal their um, gay identity. The thing that really um, you know, sort of rises to the surface in terms of, of, you know, basic stress biology is this state of fear, the kind of social condition in which you feel most comfortable versus the kind of social condition in which you feel most threatened. So once we had threat on the map as a potential mediator, that allowed us to fairly quickly carry out a series of studies where we said, well, we know what happens in a body when a person feels threatened. We know they fire these flight or flight stress responses. We know the neurotransmitter released from the neurons involved in this process, norepinephrine. Uh, we know that those neural fibers terminate in all kinds of places in the body, including the organs that house the majority of our immune cells, including the cells that are infected with HIV infection. And we can then ask some simple questions about what would happen if you were a cell infected with HIV and somebody dumped a bunch of norepinephrine on your head, what would that do to expression of the viral genome? So the first maybe five to six years of my work really was simply devoted to uh, carrying out a series of studies, mapping all the different molecular responses that a cell had to norepinephrine, an immune cell, 
and then determining how those responses, which made good sense to the cell in its original state, might inadvertently support the expression of the viral genome and, and greater viral replication. Now, as you describe this, you sound less and less like a psychologist, what most people think of as a psychologist, and more and more like a molecular biologist or immunologist or geneticist. Um, were you drifting into a different field, or has psychology changed that much? Has some branch of psychology changed that much? I think both. Um, you know, the, this was, uh, again, a... Um, a period where the dramatic acceleration in the technology available made it possible, uh, and, and in some sense sort of almost inevitable, that this this you know previously thin contact between experience and biology would start enlarging. So it, it really was uh, you know sort of like being thrown into uh, you know this wide open field where you could go any direction and discover something great. Mm. I want to ask a couple of cautionary questions that undoubtedly you addressed and many people threw at you during uh, this research. One is, you know, again, we're trying to connect this experience of threat. And you said fight or flight. That's usually a panic response that involves an immediate threat, right? But you're describing people who are like closeted gay men who are experiencing not some immediate panic-inducing threat, but more of a constant, low-level isolation, maybe psychological pressure. Uh, do those two correlate? Yeah. It turns out there are uh, constant micro-panics going on in our bodies all the time that we are largely unaware of. And this has actually been uh, both one of the most interesting revelations of the neuroscience here and also one of our most vexing challenges, because if that's really true, then what's most important for, let's say, gene expression dynamics out in your, your tissues uh, may well not be very apparent to your conscious mind. In fact, there's many cases where we ask people with questionnaires or other kinds of methodologies. You can even do this with brain scanning. We ask them how stressed they are, and they say, I am I am really stressed. And we look at their body, and their sympathetic nervous system says, actually, you're basically doing fine. There's other people we ask are you stressed? They say, no, everything is fine. This is perfectly normal. And their bodies are chugging away in high defense mode, spraying out norepinephrine. Now, not at the same intense level that you just described where you have a conscious state of panic. Right. So their heart rates might not be elevated and they might not be sweating and, you know, their muscles might not be tensing up. But it's still going on under the surface. Yeah. And in fact, they, they may be doing those things that you uh -huh. just talked about, but at very low levels, levels that aren't consciously detectable because we're busy looking at and thinking about other things. Huh. And this has been one of our most fascinating insights, I think, about uh, adverse social environments like poverty um, and uh, other kinds of chronic risk states, is that the human mind uh, is programmed to comprehend things, ge develop expectations about what the world is like, and then to essentially ignore everything that meets your expectations. So often when we ask people at, at, you know, at the, the low end of some social status hierarchy or people living in poverty how stressed they are, they say, actually, you know, today's pretty good. I'm, I'm not that terrifically stressed. Uh, when we look at what's going on around them in their environment, we say, wow, if I lived here, I'd be stressed because there is a lot of chaos and confusion and, frankly, a lot of uncertainty about am I going to be able to pay my rent? Where, how am I going to get to work? Is this person over here reliable? Is that person going to steal from me? Who do I have to watch out for? Am I going to lose my job? This never-ending fusillade of doubts and concerns that start to creep into worries but what's amazing about the human mind is it can come to believe that that is normal. Mm. And when it thinks that is normal, and I ask you then, are you stressed? You say, no, it's a perfectly fine, normal day. I can handle it. I, I take pride in my ability to deal with this life. But all the while, our fight or flight stress response is in there helping us out, keeping the machinery going so that we can actually do this. So we don't necessarily know our own state very well. We aren't really good reporters <laughs> on our own internal state. We might be undergoing these micro panics, even though we think everything's cool and copacetic. Uh, 
that alone is, is very interesting. I, I want to ask one other cautionary question. It's one we alluded to earlier, which is controlling for all these other factors. So you were looking, again, at gay men with HIV and their survival rates and uh, overall health in relation to the state of stress and the state of fear and isolation and, and those kinds of factors. You were able to control for all the other things that might have been affecting these outcomes, like the strength of their social network, the closeted men, I would imagine, don't have nearly the support network when they have HIV. In fact, many of them weren't telling people they had HIV, right? Because they were right. closeted. Again, medical care, all the other things that would, might play into their uh, health profile. The answer is yes and no. Fortunately, uh, we had existing measures of many of those. In fact, all of the potential you know, counter-explanations that, that you've just described available. But the, the no comes from the fact that all of those measures are based on people's self-reports. And as we just discussed, mm -hmm. those are subject to all sorts of, uh, you know, inaccuracy, sometimes intentional, but often unintentional. They're tremendously noisy. So I don't claim for a moment that actually, uh, you know, the, the correlational studies that we had done then are at all decisive or definitive. And in fact, this is true in general, as we try and understand the biology of human existence, simply because it's unethical to conduct the kinds right. of randomized controlled yeah. experiments in people's lives that would allow us to decisively say, well, we've you know randomized you to come out of the closet. Let's see what happens to your biology there. That would be a tall order. Well, there was the Tuskegee experiment, but we don't do that anymore, That's supposedly. Right. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. For good reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so would people be right in, in drawing the conclusion from what we said so far that uh, someone with HIV who could somehow address these psychological factors could actually improve their, their outlook? Well, that's a controversial area. So in principle, that should be true. But for that to be true, we would need psychological interventions that made really substantial impacts on people's perceptions of the world, their perceptions in particular of their safety versus vulnerability. And these interventions would need to persist over time uh, in fairly remarkable ways. We would need to almost be able to revolutionize a person's personality and worldview mm, mm. for these interventions to work well. Sometimes that can happen. There are, you know, sort of teachable moments in people's lives where they can undertake these really substantial um, changes in, in personality and worldview. But that's a tall order in general. Uh, so I'm not sure that that would be, you know, feasible, routinely, or particularly scalable. I think mm. you, you, both for ripeness purposes and just, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a tremendously skilled clinician to be able to help people make these changes. Uh, we're not all lucky enough to have the ripe moment and the great you know, sort of partnership resources needed to, to really help this along. Many of us are, you know, sort of um, highly connected up to big, complicated lives, and uh, it's not so easy to change those mm -hmm. big, complicated mm -hmm. lives. So mm -hmm. another approach is to concede that psychological interventions may not be the most practical or efficient approach to changing these things, but nevertheless, we should uh, we one, one might potentially decide we should try to protect people against the adverse health effects of these kinds of psychological stresses and strains. So one strategy is to, uh, you know, potentially ignore people's psychology altogether and do what we do when we're trying to map out these biological pathways and cells. Uh, when when we you know put HIV into a cell and we stimulate the cell to make more virus. Uh, we don't try to block that dynamic by putting the cell in group therapy or having it meditate. We drop a drug on it that blocks that receptor so that the norepinephrine cannot interact with that beta adrenergic receptor and kick off this biochemical cascade that eventually results in the activation of the viral genome. So these are great drugs we've had for 40 years now. We used to use them to protect people against the adverse effects of stress on their heart. But it turns out it's the same biochemistry that runs the interactions with the immune cells. So we use the same drugs, and we show that when you drop norepinephrine on a cell that's gotten a beta blocker to protect it, you get no activation of the viral genome. Now, these are the same kinds of beta blockers people use to uh, ward off uh, stage fright and other stressful reactions? Yeah, that's right. You know, there's 
at least 10 different types of beta blockers right now, all targeting different subtypes of beta adrenergic receptors. It turns out there's really one receptor type that's predominantly responsible for these. So we need to pick the right beta blocker for this to work. You can't just take any one mm. and expect this to work. Mm. And unfortunately, you can't take the one, it turns out, that most heart attack patients take. Ah. You really need to be able to take the first generation beta blocker that has the effect of blocking so-called beta-2 adrenergic receptors. And at the uh, expense of the exciting biochemistry lesson we had scheduled for later today, I will not <laughs> you know, sort of take you any farther into that cascade. Well, you said one thing that, that you know, because HIV is not something I know a lot about, um, is news to me. I mean, honestly, I knew about protease inhibitors, those things that prevent the virus from successfully replicating in the cell. But you're talking about... Uh, HIV treatment that involves interrupting the stress response. Yes. And is that a common treatment now? Not now, because the protease inhibitors are so good uh -huh. that there's very little room for an extra, you know, positive kick from the nervous system's intervention. The protease inhibitors are 99.999% effective. The beta adrenergic blockade is about, you know, 60, 70 percent effective, and it blocks only the component of viral replication that is stimulated in the first place by stress biology. So there's still a lot of other influences running the virus, mm. and the beta blocker doesn't block those. So I don't want people to come away from this conversation feeling like, wow, I should drop my protease inhibitors <laughs> and get on beta blockers yeah. right away. Yeah. What I do want people to understand, though, is that we can actually get in there and fairly decisively experiment on the cellular level to show, as long as I can assume a person feels threatened for an extended period of time, I can fairly safely assume that there will be more norepinephrine at various spots in their body where these mm. nerve fibers terminate. And after that, it's basically a ballistic process. It's a, a simple step forward from norepinephrine to the receptor to the viral genome to more replication to quicker cell death to the you know more rapid collapse of the immune system in general. Well, we've been talking about HIV just uh, really as an example, one example among, I guess, many of this bigger concept, which is the way in which human experience can actually affect the genome affect which genes turn on, which ones turn off, and thus our physiology, our health, uh, you know, our physical being. Um, and you've looked at a lot of other instances. I mean, you've looked at things like loneliness. You've looked at the conditions that, that poverty gives rise to. Tell us a little bit more about the big picture you put together. So much of this story actually got started with HIV. Uh, as we were trying to understand why the viral genome was waking up and replicating better uh, in a sort of a norepinephrine-dosed cell, um, one of the things we discovered is that there were a set of antiviral defense proteins that a cell should make uh, called type 1 interferons that don't get made in cells that have been dosed with norepinephrine. Mm. So we were aware of that, and that was one of the major molecular pathways by which this stress neurotransmitter was promoting viral gene expression. So a really simplified view of what you just said, fight or flight type responses, that is, uh, you know, stress responses that we may experience in one big dose that we're aware of, or maybe in a lot of small doses that we're not aware of, actually interferes with our ability to fight viruses. Now, I would have thought it would be exactly the opposite. Why wouldn't anything stressful make your, put all your systems on guard? You know? Seemed stupid to me as well. <laughs> so at this point, I was lucky enough that, uh, you know, uh, about that time as I was pondering this question, uh, those helpful scientists sequenced the human genome and uh, some other helpful scientists started building out these microarrays that allowed us to look at the expression of all 21,000 or so human genes at the same time. So we could look. This is such an essential technology uh, in your work. Why don't you tell us just briefly what a DNA microarray is? It's basically, you can think of it as a, a large field with a bunch of small probes in it. And each probe can specifically detect one of the 21,000 or so human genes that can get transcribed from DNA into an RNA form. Is it a chip? Uh, it's actually a, a microscope slide 
Oh, it's a slide. Yeah, okay. covered with um, some, you know, basically special coatings, and then uh, with these tiny little dabs of these detectors um, dropped in specific spots on the slide so that we know uh, that if there is some RNA binding here, and we make the RNA fluorescent so we can use sensitive cameras to measure exactly how much RNA is at any given spot, and we have a map to tell us at that spot is the probe that detects the gene ADRB2. Mm -hmm. So you can isolate the DNA from a cell, put it on one of these microarrays, and depending on what lights up where, you can say, oh, that gene's on or that gene's off, or that gene's really running full bore and that one's going kind of slow. That's exactly right. Wow. So the challenge now is, what do I do with 21,000 numbers? How do I make sense of that? Uh, and so that's really where my sort of odd bird experience in uh, behavioral science suddenly uh, became a profound gift. So this is exactly the mathematical structure of the problem that behavioral scientists face all the time. And molecular biologists historically have not had to worry about because they have their test tubes and their cells. They've got that one molecule in there and they're dropping another molecule in to see what happens there is not a whole heck of a lot going on besides the things that you can experimentally manipulate. So that's very different than having to look at 21,000 genes all at once. But uh, if you instead think of the genes as a sort of a society of individuals who are collectively trying to get along and accomplish something great together, and you think of that society as having norms and rules and uh, kind of a structure to it, then suddenly you have a very different view of what's going on and you, you start to think in these network models and mathematical terms about big ensembles of genes conspiring together to you know sort of do something. Or in the case of these annoying interferons in the face of norepinephrine, conspicuously failing to appear when they ought to. Are you saying, though, that, Steve, that you took techniques that you had learned from, say, social psychology, mathematical analytic techniques, and were applying them to these DNA microarray readings in a way that allowed you to you know, extract some big picture that molecular biologists themselves hadn't been able to get before? That's exactly right. Now, wow. I won't say that no molecular biologist had ever thought of this, but that was one of the biggest cultural challenges when these genome scale technologies came on the scene was getting the practitioners who were very deep in their understanding of a small number of genes to start thinking about hundreds or thousands of genes and to start looking for patterns across many genes instead of trying to sift out that one magical needle in the haystack. So I thought it was insane that you would get a list of 21,000 numbers uh, including, you know, hundreds that were going in a really interesting direction in the norepinephrine-treated cells, hundreds of other genes that were going in the opposite direction in the norepinephrine-treated cells, and then comb through there, pick out one, and go study it. I'm like, what about the other 200? What about them? That is so exciting. What are they all up to? And so that is really how our, you know, sort of mindset and philosophy of data analysis ended up being quite different than what was typically going on at the time. And that allowed us to recognize themes very quickly. So for instance, when we first did these genome uh, microarrays, we could say, wow, it, that's true. Almost all the interferon-related genes are shut down in the norepinephrine-treated cells. But on the other hand, over here, many of the genes that are involved in inflammation are upregulated. So we, we could do this in cells that were treated with norepinephrine, and we could come up with some really interesting molecular conclusions about what was going on in these cells under experimental test tube conditions. But at some point, you wonder whether that has anything to do with the reality of human life. And so that's really what led us to go out into the wild and find people that were leading lives that themselves were stressful or... Um, you know, traumatic or risky, and ask whether the same genome scale dynamics were unfolding in their immune cells as what we saw in the test tube. Have those techniques that you, you know, helped to pioneer then, have they caught on? Are they being used a lot now? Yeah, they certainly are by behavioral scientists who are very comfortable with them. Um, I would say biological scientists are still largely in this one gene, find the magic needle in the haystack mentality. Wow. 
Now, there are a small number of exceptionally well-trained genomicists who are now starting to appreciate that the one-gene approach uh, not only you know, doesn't really yield uh, the same kind of stable, reliable results that they had hoped, but are also wondering what happened to the other 200 genes <laughs> and uh, wondering whether you know, there might be some bigger principle at work. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that we're the only people doing this kind of work. But it has certainly been a very different approach and, frankly, continues to garner a certain amount of skepticism and resistance uh, from the people who uh, are used to doing it one gene at a time. Is there a name, though, for this um, this cross-disciplinary thing that you're doing that, that has taken techniques from psychology and also questions from psychology and mix them with genomics and bioinformatics? Uh, is there a name for it? Yeah, we call it social genomics uh, more uh, as a you know sort of crutch until we find a better name, basically. But the idea being that, you know, genomics we typically think of as being sort of cellular. Uh, and uh, the social component just reminds us that cells have a psychological and social context and that things, even things outside the body, like the social world, somehow filter their way through our consciousness, into our brains, down into our fight or flight neurons, and eventually all the way out to our immune cells. So you've you've been looking at lived circumstances, the way real people live and the kinds of stresses and challenges they face. And on the other hand, the actual activation or deactivation of genes in their cells. What sort of generalizations have you come up with so far? Well, the first study we did looked at a very small number of people who uh, were um, you know, basically suffering from uh, one of the most adverse social risk factors that we know of, which is chronic social isolation, people who felt disconnected from the rest of humanity. Um, and they had been in a study uh, then at that point for about five years. And uh, we selected a group of people that basically every single year you ask them said, I really don't feel like there's anybody in the world who's going to be there for me, anybody who I feel close to or connected with. And we could compare their gene expression profiles with those of people who said, wow, I've got great social support, lots of friends. If anything happened to me, I know exactly who I'd turn to. I've got lots of support. And uh, the first thing we noticed when we, we did that study was that uh, just as I, I described earlier with the norepinephrine, the people who were chronically lonely seem to have low levels of those antiviral uh, interferon genes being expressed, and they had relatively high levels of genes uh, being expressed that were involved in inflammation or the earliest stage of a cellular defense response against a pathogen or tissue injury. So that pattern made sense to us because it, it looked a lot like what we saw when we did little experiments in test tubes on, on leukocytes. So we were, you know, actually kind of happy to see that the test tubes were, were proving out to some extent in the real world, out in the, you know, sort of the, the body of, of a, a lived life. What um, surprised me, though, was the extent to which that same theme popped up once again when we started looking at people who were confronting very different types of adversity. For instance, people who were uh, caring for a spouse who had brain cancer and was almost certainly going to die soon. When we looked at gene expression profiles in caregivers of cancer patients, we found the same general pattern that we saw in the lonely people. More, uh, in, uh, more inflammation-related gene expression and less expression of these antiviral interferon genes. That struck me as, as surprising, uh, in part because when you've got 21,000 genes moving hither and yon, uh, under you know, just random circumstances, you would expect almost never to see the same thing twice. Uh, so to see so many of the same themes emerge, many of the same specific genes, but even more importantly, these broad themes related to the function of the genes, um, inflammation and antiviral responses, that uh, was uh, vanishingly improbable as a chance coincidence. Were you seeing the things that you might expect as a consequence of those genetic changes, that is, increased viral infections and increased inflammation in their bodies? Yes. In fact, we were. Um, and this was uh, at a point in which we had studied 
viral infections for a while and already knew that socially isolated, lonely people were at somewhat higher risk for contracting a viral infection given a fixed exposure. So a number of mm. studies had been done showing that uh, if you spray a controlled dose of a rhinovirus up people's nose, that the mm -hmm. introverts were about three to four times more likely to get sick than the extroverts were. Mm. And you don't mean a virus uh, from rhinocera. You mean uh... <laughs> One of the common cold-causing virus. Cold virus, exactly. <laughs> Though I, I, I'm not opposed to the rhinoceros <laughs> study, if you can pull it off. What about inflammation? Uh, which, by the way, you know, some people think of it as a reaction to getting bruised or having an infection, but it's also uh, certainly a component of asthma and arthritis and all kinds of other illnesses. So inflammation, at the time we started these studies, was just coming on the scene as uh, an interesting generic risk factor for a lot of diseases that we had known from the epidemiology associated with adversity. Um, in the years before this molecular revolution, we really thought about diseases in relatively specific terms, at least at the cellular level. We felt that an atherosclerotic plaque in heart disease was very, very different than uh, a lymph node in which immune cells were infected by HIV. and we uh, Oh, and by the way, you just named yet another inflammatory problem, atherosclerosis. That's right. And we thought about all of those things as very different than cancer, which we thought of as, as you know, sort of damaged DNA that allowed cells to, to, you know, run amok and grow like crazy. So right about the time that inflammation was emerging in the genomic studies, uh, that was starting to recurrently appear in these studies of the basic biology of very different disease processes. And we started to notice, and, and others did as well, that this cross-cutting theme uh, provided a, a nice, at that point, circumstantial explanation for how specific kinds of environmental risk factors like poverty or bereavement or... Um, loneliness, social isolation, that kind of thing. This really provided a nice explanation. If loneliness and poverty and bereavement could all activate inflammatory genes, that would explain, potentially at least, why these diverse types of social and psychological risk factors seemed to recurrently associate with the same kinds of diseases and what those seemingly diverse diseases actually had in common. It's as though inflammation was sort of grand central station of these intersecting epidemiologic uh, lines of, of research. Well, you're obviously creeping up on a big theory, a big one. <laughs> Do any alarm bells go off when all the data seem to line up so well? What sort of caution does that set up for you? As someone, you know, who's seen all these headlines over the years, you know, announcing a massive discovery that turns out not to be quite so massive after all? Well, certainly. How are you feeling about all this? Yeah, I, I would say, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, I'm feeling pretty well, but only because I start from the position that, that you just articulated, which is I sort of presume that nothing will work, uh, that everything we thought was, was wrong, and that uh, it's completely hopeless, which is good because completely hopeless turns out to be a manageable statistical problem. Completely hopeless sort of corresponds to randomness. So when you start to see recurrent themes, you maybe want to check the hope a little bit, but it, there's this uh, irrepressible optimism that starts to emerge that maybe you've bumped into some big principle that uh, you may not know exactly how, but somehow will help you put together the pieces mm. of this puzzle mm. about how it all fits together. And that's mm. really, if you recall, we started off with viruses and wondering what's going on there. Uh, and at some point, at the same time as we were looking at the system as a whole in terms of viruses, we started noticing the inflammation that at the same time was rearing up in these very different literatures on basic disease processes. So we started to then ask ourselves, if this could explain both why adversity and stress is associated with more vulnerability to viral infections as well as more vulnerability to cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases, um, that, you know, that seems appealing as a kind of grand unified theory of stress and disease. But why would you build 
a human genome that did this stuff when it was stressed? <laughs> that's, that's always been a question about, for me about the stress response. Why make organisms weaker when they're under attack? You know, <laughs> That's right. So one of the things that the genomics revolution helped us out with was it, it got us out of black and white thinking. So the, the mentality up until, I would say, maybe the late 80s was that stress largely suppressed the immune system, that you know everything went down for the count and you were just um, essentially wide open for plunder by every disease out there, at least every disease that the immune system would combat. But what we started to notice is that, well, it's true the interferons went down, but not everything went down. Uh, the inflammatory genes actually went up, way, way up. And that was starting to be kind of a, a regular result at some point after the five or ten of these studies in different types of adversity, poverty, you know, bereavement, post-traumatic stress disorder, all kinds of different adverse life circumstances started to show us similar kinds of things at the genomic level. Um, and some of these things involve the immune system becoming more active in this inflammation sense in particular. So that um, you know, it, we can we can discuss uh, in a moment sort of where that that takes us in the psychology. But for for the present, uh, we might just ask, you know, what sense does this make? And that's the great thing about looking at things in a genomic perspective is that you're sort of you know lashed to evolutionary theory pretty tightly. It's you know you you have to be able to make sense of everything a genome is doing in terms of natural selection, how does this favor the organism and its survival in a complicated and, and you know, threatening, but also, you know, rich and inviting world. So evolution's not perfect, right? It does screw things up or it does cause problems even as it fixes other ones. So do we always have to look for a great story that says this really is adaptive, that this is really optimal for something? Well, it's not a bad thing to try. <laughs> okay. I, would, I would say you're right. Okay. We, you know, sometimes we fail on that count, but it's pretty embarrassing to be walking around saying, I've got a principle and it makes no sense. It's kind of a headache from a presentational standpoint. So we try to avoid that. Okay, you're on then. So in what way could it be adaptive to suppress uh, viral defenses and ramp up inflammatory responses, even to the point where they might go overboard and hurt you, which inflammation sometimes does. It's a terrible idea in the world <laughs> that we live in. And this had us stumped for uh, a while until I remembered that I had been, you know, basically pretty stupid about this and was thinking about the world we live in because it's completely upside down compared to the world that our genomes grew up in, which was you know, the Pleistocene, where we're running around for, you know, a couple million years with about 20 to 80 other people in a small band uh, where, you know, the humans around us were absolutely our, our greatest resources. And uh, the world outside was, you know, sometimes threatening, oftentimes, you know, very hospitable. Uh, but, you know, certainly human beings were distinctive uh, even a couple million years ago in their uh, intense sociality. And sociality has worked well for us. It allows us to band together and uh, kill the big beasts and eat them. But it also has some uh, epidemiologic disadvantages related to infectious diseases in general and viral infections in particular. Viral infections can't live outside our bodies at all for any extended period of time. They need to hop from one human to another pretty quickly if they are to survive. Or, or into an animal reservoir in some cases. Yeah, although actually that is turns out to be pretty challenging. Viruses have to live inside our cells, and different species have sufficiently different cells that lots of times a virus from a dog can't live inside mm. a cell from a human. Yeah, I'm just thinking about those those many zoonotic diseases that we're we've been discovering over the last you know couple decades. That's right. Uh, like HIV, which seems to have come from other That's primates. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, even this day, even to this day, we can't get monkey. Uh, virus to replicate in human cells mm -hmm. very well, and mm -hmm. we can't get human HIV to replicate in, in monkey cells. So things do make the hop, but it's still a challenge. So the, the take-home point really is that sociality brings a particular kind of viral disease risk with it. And what we see when we compare across different species is the more social its life strategy is, the more viral infections the organism tends to have, and presumably as a result, 
the stronger the basal antiviral response they have. So there's a deep connection between sociality and this strong antiviral bias of the human immune system. So you can think of us as, by default, sociable and uh, kind of bulked up in the direction of viral defenses. So is this where you're going then? If we're isolated, if we're alone, we don't need quite as strong a viral defense because we're not as likely to catch something from someone else. On the other hand, if we are isolated and alone or stressed in that way, what about the inflammatory response, the other side of this trade-off? So what is inflammation good for? That's the question. Yeah. And the answer is bacteria and wounding injuries. So what we'd really like to be able to do is when we're threatened, uh, we'd like to be able to drop that antiviral defense for a bit because it turns out there's an intrinsic trade-off with the inflammatory response that we'd like to ramp up. So we oh, there to... is? Is it an energy cost, or what is it? It's actually uh, slightly more complicated than that. You could energetically do both of these things, but running, running one response tends to favor the pathogen that the other response oh, battles. Oh, wow, wow. So you can either be really good at fighting bacteria or really good at fighting viruses. But probably not both at the same time. Really? I didn't know that. Well, actually, we all know that. We, we find out uh, every time we, we get a cold that, uh, wow, you know, we're three or four days into this thing, and suddenly we get this huge sinus headache. That oh, sinus headache isn't infection. coming from the virus. Oh. That's right. So we knock down that viral uh -huh. infection in our lungs. Uh, but what's happening is the bacteria are running amok because okay. they love antiviral gene responses. They love the products of uh, antiviral immune response. Wow. And the same thing happens with inflammation. Uh, if you get a uh, bacterial infection and you ramp up a strong antiviral response instead of a strong inflammatory response, bacteria often love that. They think that's wonderful. Mm. That's like fuel for their fire. Mm. Mm. So the human genome has a big stake in making the right decision about which kinds of immune response genes it's going to express. And under basal conditions, it probably makes pretty good sense to brace yourself against viruses. But if suddenly life gets hard, you're either alone, in which case you're probably going to be injured by predators, or if you're with a bunch of people who do not like you and are likely to injure you as a result of that, mm. it is a terrific idea to, at the same time as your fight-or-flight stress response is ramping up all of your other organismic defenses. It's getting your muscles ready to go, getting your heart pumping blood, sending oxygen out to your tissues, focusing your concentration and attention, amping up your coordination, doing all kinds of other adaptive things. This would also be a great time to get ready to be injured, mm. to get a jump on whatever bacterial infection might be introduced by being cut or wounded or somehow injured. Now, now would you would you agree that what you've just said is very tantalizing and interesting, but it is very conjectural, right, this evolutionary story? Yep, and absolutely. It, it may leave out the fact that a lot of you know, recent evolutionary science has said that, you know, we aren't stuck in the Pleistocene. We have evolved quite a bit over shorter time scales. So why still have this seemingly primitive and not very useful in modern in modern world trade off between viral and bacterial responses, you know? But uh do you really want to talk about the trade off? <laughs> <laughs> if you can do it quickly, yes. <laughs> The trade-off seems to be intrinsic to the pathogens, actually, not to the human genome. Ah. So as long as the human genome confronts the array of pathogens that we continue to have, it probably still needs to be doing what it's doing in terms of trading off antiviral responses for inflammatory responses. Uh, if we really significantly reduce the total uh, you know, selective pressure of bacterial infections for an extended period of time, which is essentially the world we live in post-antibiotics. And post uh, the implementation of sort of public sanitation and hygiene and things that have cut down on our bacterial exposure. Correct. You know, it, it may well be the case that we see less pressure for the maintenance of that strong trade-off uh, and uh, a little bit more, uh, let's say, indecisive or oscillatory immune response. Um, now, I didn't want this particular program to go in the direction of medical advice because I feel deeply unqualified and deeply skeptical sometimes of dispensing it in forums like this. 
What would you say to people who are listening to all this very intently and saying, okay, how should I change my life? I would say change your life in terms of what creates the best life and uh, have faith that your body will take care of the rest. And that's not to say that your body is going to be perfect or that you'll be immortal as a result, uh, but what it does concede is it is much harder to game this system than uh, any of us might guess initially. So I'll give you two examples. So you're, you're about to say that you know just quick behavioral modification stuff isn't going to solve all these problems? Probably not. Okay. So for a couple of reasons. Uh, behavioral modification, you know, for this whole system to work, we would need a psychological or a social intervention that leaves you feeling substantially safer uh, almost all of the time. Than, than you feel right now. And in fact, you know, all of cultural evolution, sadly, is probably pointed in the other direction. American culture is probably the, uh, you know, pinnacle of a uh, constant sense of vague threat and uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, in fact, the safer we get, you know, statistically speaking, the more neurotic we seem to get about our fears. That's, that's I think, <laughs> exactly right. The sort of hygiene hypothesis of, uh, you know, sort of public life. <laughs> <laughs> but also just the uh, the laissez-faire uh, political philosophy, the sense of, of not having a safety net, the sense of independence and constant competition, this uh, you know sense of, of Darwinian uh, struggle. All of these are exactly the kind of low-level uncertainties and threats that it's easy for us to forget about until they're not there. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is actually the you know the the gift that anthropologists have is this opportunity to live completely different ways and see that it, it doesn't have to be this way and then to wonder what the implications of of in some sense choosing to live this way might really be. Mm. So listeners, if you're uh, paying attention, no panacea is at this point for these problems based on changing attitudes or changing behavior, but still some really fascinating and I think challenging insights into the way mind and body intersect. And the fact that they do so in, in your model, the one that you're putting out, through the genome is particularly, I think, novel to many people because people are still taught very much what I was taught when I was a kid learning about biology, that the genome, our DNA, is this master plan. It's a top-down kind of totalitarian dictator that tells everything what to do. And yeah, environment may affect our bodies, and there might be things that, that affect our health and our, our longevity that come from the outside, but the genome is pretty much doing its thing no matter what, the same way. You're describing, though, a network of feedback loops in which the genome is just another node in the network. That's right, and it's a listener. It is paying attention to the world outside and taking everything that it has learned, uh, which is encoded in its sequence, it's learned through evolution over, you know, at this point now, millions of years, uh, a bunch of propositions about which genes I should turn on in response to um, various types of coded conditions. So if I'm an immune cell, there are some circumstances that are important for my designated mission. Uh, if I see some bacteria, I need to turn on some immune response genes that will help me battle bacteria. If I see a virally infected cell, I need to turn on a different set of genes to help uh, attack that cell and kill it before it can spread the virus. So that's one kind of decision, but that's not the only kind of information that actually matters for getting the totality of a cell's missions right. So another thing a genome might need to know is whether I'm likely to be attacked by viruses or bacteria. That's the anticipatory part that we talked about before, where the genome says, hey, I can listen to the sympathetic nervous system and make a pretty decent prediction about whether bacteria are going to be my next big threat or whether viruses are going to be my next big threat. And if I do that, I can get a jump on the bad guys. And if I'm doing that and the guy next door isn't, I will live. Hmm. Um, now, though we get our genome at conception and though the actual uh, sequence of you know, DNA letters doesn't change unless there's a mutation or an accident of some kind. The turning on and turning off of genes, which ones are working, which ones don't work, I mean, there's massive variation. Gene expression is what makes a fat cell, a lowly fat cell, and a brain cell, 
a smart little computer, right? That's huge. So if circumstances and, and as you say, mental phenomena, our feelings, can change the expression of genes, how much can they change it and how fast? That's a great question. Um, so there's a couple of simple observations we can make. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here and almost no matter what experience I have, my kidneys are not going to convert into lobsters. <laughs> so there's a set of things that are just off the map in right. terms of the, if you will, wired in potentialities, that menu of options that our genome has about which blocks to express and which blocks to leave silent in any given circumstance. Now, that said, uh, there's lots of things that uh, may get activated in response to, uh, you know, some kind of experience I have. These experiences, you know, typically aren't uh, directly regulating what's going on in the cell. They need to get converted by my brain into hormones and neurotransmitters that go out, and they're actually the, you know, sort of the final proximal determinant of, of what happens lots of times. So the real magic in the system is really in the set theory that determines which genes get activated by which stimuli, by which hormone or neurotransmitter or which bacterial cell wall receptor or viral infection sensor, um, but which you know sensor of the pH in my kidneys or so many other different physiologic processes. So it's really this magic of trial and error, again, over millions of years of, of you know, genes creating proteins, you might think almost at random initially, um, and then just trying out lots of different combinations uh, as the, the genome evolves, different sets of genes come to be correlated in their activity as their, their you mm. know, DNA sequences accidentally come to share common motifs, common, you know, maybe this, this key like GACTG or something like that. That becomes a target for a signal. And if that's there in two different genes... And again, this cell or this organism happens to turn on those two different genes, and that works better than what the guy next door is doing or what we did yesterday, that will survive and thrive. And that seems like a kind of a lowly, bootstrapping, slow way to go, mm. but with two million years of, you know, just you know, sort of what you might call relatively complex organism experience, that turns out to be plenty of time to put together some pretty fancy packages. So that's natural selection. But what about changes in gene expression? How quickly can they happen? If I started behaving in a, you know, an erratic, threatening manner right now, could we do an assay of your genes and see a change on the spot? Probably it takes about 5 to 20 minutes for noticeable changes in RNA to start accumulate. Uh, we know that the signal that gets kicked off by, let's say, a, a fight-or-flight stress hormone gets... Uh, basically delivered to the DNA within about three to five minutes, we can see the protein so-called transcription factor actually bound onto DNA and signaling this RNA copying machinery to come by and make a copy of this gene. So mm -hmm. in about five minutes, you've got the gene turned on. In about 20 to 30 minutes, you start to notice an accumulation of that particular gene's messenger RNA. And in the absence of any other perturbation, that tends to peak out about two hours after the initial stimulus uh, and then kind of settle back down to its basal state. The big uh, question about these kinds of dynamics, the, the, the big question going forward is whether you will see positive feedback and whether the gene product that gets made uh, in one round actually feeds back and stimulates further rounds of transcription of that gene, in which case you could have really kind of explosive exponential growth of a particular gene's expression. That's often mm -hmm. what we see, for example, in immune responses, mm -hmm. where the magnitude of transcription of, of you know, key immune response genes goes from essentially zero to maybe 100,000 copies of messenger RNA in each cell. Uh, and that's because those, those immune response genes are tremendously dangerous to have on, so you really want them shut down if you don't need them, but they are exceedingly effective uh, if deployed uh, in large amounts under the right circumstances. Mm. But you're saying that, you know, these, these changes in gene expression can happen pretty rapidly, that they can be pretty big. So you, you're a guy who's clearly unafraid of big questions. 
and this is both a scientific or maybe a bit of a political question because it is a politicized subject, nature and nurture. I mean, the simple idea that we have on the one side our genome, which does its thing, and on the other side the environment, which might be the natural environment or might be the human environment, our society and so on, and they each, you know, feed into what makes us us, you know, in, in some as yet undetermined, uh, you know, proportions. <laughs> it's not that simple, no? I mean, you just described, again, a loop, and in fact, a web of loops that are going on all the time. Does it make any sense to even talk about nature and nurture the way we have traditionally done so? I think that it does make sense in just the way you spoke of it. First, it's not nature or nurture. It is nature and nurture. Neither can get along without the other. So they're, in fact, so intrinsically interactive that uh, genomes don't work without nurture there to help them along. And nurture can't come about unless there's a genomic plan for how to create the nurturing thing <laughs> itself. So on some level, uh, we can't even understand one without reference to the other. The One of the you know vexing things for genomics researchers is they've been wholly unable to account for how organisms form simply by looking at the nature of the genes that are in there. You need some spark of life from some kind of maternal organism to help structure these early rounds of gene expression that will even create... Uh, you know, sort of the growing cell mass that will eventually become, let's say, a, a, you know, a little baby. Uh, and the same thing is true for growing up an immune response. You need input from the outside or else the response doesn't happen. Mm. And you need further input from the outside to say, okay, stop this response before we kill the mothership here. You know, the, the sort of classic uh, test case for nature versus nurture is identical twins. They both have exactly the same genome, both twins. Tiny mutations may occur in a lifetime, but, you know, that's meaningless compared to what's the same. On the other hand, they might have radically different experiences, especially if they're raised apart. How big a difference could these changes in gene expression, let's say, make on top of that shared genetic endowment? Can identical twins be super different? I mean, they may look the same, but can they be different in almost every other way? At the molecular level, absolutely. I mean, in fact, it, you know, there is some similarity between gene expression profiles in twins. A little bit more than there is between, you know, sort of any two randomly picked human beings. But they're certainly not approaching identical. And for the reasons you just discussed, the, your own individual personal history of exposures and experiences, differences in how you choose to lead your life as a twin. You know, you can't be sitting in the same place as your twin is. You have to carve out different territories in life, and that includes both space and, and the social world. All of this gets in there very quickly. Uh, we, we contend with this all the time in research because we use genetically identical mice, and yet you go in and you look at a cage full of mice, and one of them sitting there beating on everybody else's head. The rest are cowering in the corner. A few of the ones cowering in the corner are doing okay. They're making it through. One of them is just literally falling apart. You've got to separate the mice before all of your experiment goes south. But, uh, you know, there's nothing in the genome that encodes those differences in behavior in any kind of dictatorial sense. Mm. What it does do is it sets up, a, you know, a bunch of brains in these mice that can learn all kinds of things and tiny little random effects of which mouse happens to have a set of experiences first end up becoming the knowledge that if I bite this guy right there, he's going to concede defeat, and I can now rule my little cage here. And, you know, there's this tremendous non-linearity of environmental influence in these mm -hmm. systems. So that's actually the exciting part is, you know, we know these systems, uh, these genomic systems, have learned to, to not only deal with, but to some extent depend on the outside world to structure their function, and uh, now I think the exciting field is actually determining, uh, you know, sort of what you might call the, the exuberance of genomes in taking advantage of the outside world. We've, we've long thought about genomics in terms of stress and threat and negativity. And what we're increasingly now thinking about is opportunity and thriving, because it turns out that's actually what a genome is chasing after. Genomes mm -hmm. are not there to give you diseases. They're not there to, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, make you, if you will, evade uh, you know some kind of disaster. They're there to make you survive, thrive, produce progeny, develop friends, create great social networks, because that's what works in terms of survival and reproduction. Um, 
you're reminding me when we talked about identical twins of a study that I wish I'd looked it up before we did this interview, but I just thought of it. It, it was one that I read about in a book of essays by Robert Sapolsky, actually, the biologist at Stanford who studies baboons and who you know. Um, and it was a study of groups of mice who were genetically identical, who'd been raised in identical environments, at least as far as these researchers could make them identical. You know, same size cages, right. same kind of mouse cohort in this in the collection, temperature, all those things. And yet, in all kinds of important measures, the mice turned out very different. So, so their genomes, identical. The macro environment, you know, more or less identical. And yet something was different enough. Do you think their gene expression profiles would have looked very different? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think especially, you know, in the brain uh, is, is kind of the, the big black box we confront right now. But because of the spectacular energetics um, in, in the brain, the, you know, tremendous, both the number of cells that are interacting, acting with one another, the comp- tremendous plasticity, the, the, just the dynamics, there's so much going on there. Um, and that, that has, you know, for sure a gene expression component or substrate, but superimposed on that are these much faster responses related to, you know, neurotransmission and, you know, sort of electrochemical dynamics, so uh, that kind of plasticity, it, you can think of as kind of jetting around above the earth if the uh, land were what the genome is doing and the uh, you know, sort of fancy airliners in the sky as this sort of derived special product, this kind of symbolic manifestation out of that low-level infrastructure. So we just, you know, that's that magic zone we were talking about mm-hmm. before. How does thought become, you know, the concrete substrates of of biological reality. And thought is in there because when we talk about something like loneliness, you've pointed this out before elsewhere, that loneliness is not an objective phenomenon. It's how you feel. You can be lonely in a crowd or you can feel okay even when you're physically alone. So somehow thought, feeling, attitudes, mental constructs are making their way into our genes. And again, I want to say they aren't changing the sequence of genes, but they're changing the way the genes express themselves, what they do. And that's really what matters in the end. It's, a, you know, it's a really, you know, it's, it's a really intoxicating idea. What next for you and your research? Well, I've spent a lot of time studying misery and distress and, uh, you know, the biology of death and disease and, uh, Having gotten myself thoroughly depressed, I'm now somewhat <laughs> interested in aspiration and meaning and purpose and how that plays out in the genome. Does that simply block the biology of adversity or does it have its own, uh, you know, sort of separate tranche of, of you know, sort of genomic handmaidens that might uh, help facilitate that more generative and positive way of being? Another set of questions is really around, you know, these these systems dynamics that you talked about. How can we start to not just speak in this flowery way about the, you know, sort of information mesh between the, you know, the natural world outside the body and these genomic programs, but how can we metric enough of the world and enough of what the genome is doing to mm-hmm. actually concretely put these together in precise, coherent, you know, well mapped out equations, if you will. And maybe even ones with practical consequences. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Steve. My pleasure. Steve Cole is professor of medicine, psychiatry, and behavioral sciences at the UCLA School of Medicine. This has been the 7th Avenue Project, and uh, need I remind you that we are online at 7thAvenueProject.com? Okay, I'm reminding you. I'm Robert Polly, and I will be back next week. Please join us then. Thank you.